Hello, I'm Colin Gallagher, CEO at Onward and Upward, and you're listening to the Association 100 podcast, where each week we interview association leaders from across the country to hear how they're trying new things, taking big risks, and delivering value for their members. We'll explore the realities of what it means to work in and with associations and bring you the insights and inspiration you need to advance your career and make big changes at your association. Let's get started. Welcome back to the A100 podcast. I'm your host, Colin Gallagher, and I am so looking forward to today's conversation. As someone who's been a lifelong fan of video games and an association communicator for my entire career, this is pretty much my dream interview. So (laughs) today's guest is Stan Pierre-Lewis, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Entertainment Software Association. He's served in this role since 2019, after first joining ESA as its Senior Vice President and General Counsel in 2015, where he led the legal, policy, and regulatory affairs function for the association. His responsibilities included advocacy on First Amendment, technology, and intellectual property issues, as well as supervising the Global Content Protection Program. He also oversaw all governance, compliance, and contractual matters, and served as the Corporate Secretary to ESA's Board of Directors. ESA is a really impressive association that does so much on behalf of its members and the industry. And I know Stan's going to have some great insights to share with our listeners today. So Stan, thank you so much for joining us on A100. Thanks so much for having me and having heard some of your prior uh, podcasts. I love the helpful topics, but also a lot of guests whom I admire who've, who've been on your podcast. So it's a real honor and privilege to be with you. Oh, well, I love to hear that and excited to learn more about you because you have a really unique, impressive career background. And I'd just love to know more about that journey and what led you to the video game industry. Sure. It's funny when you talk about career with people, it almost seems linear and it almost never is. What I would say is my career journey has been grounded in my passion for media, the arts and technology. Almost every role I've had has had some infusion of those elements, either directly or indirectly. And I made several choices within my career moves to ensure that I could grow in each of these areas. A lot of it involves risk, experimentation, and luck. But overall, I always had the intention of creating a trajectory that kept media, the arts, and technology front and center. Initially for me, that meant going to law school. I'd actually considered going to conservatory before going to college, but determined that a life in the arts might be riskier than I was ready for, given what I'd seen of what was developing in that scene. And also the talent level is just so enormous that you have to have extreme confidence. But following law school, clerked for a federal judge, which was eye-opening and how the justice system works, but also in thinking about how you dispense justice and how you think about issues, and not just in a general sense, but even between corporate competitors and trying to figure out what is the right outcome. And so a lot of learning there. Following that, I did a three-year stint at a law firm in Washington, where I got to work on a host of issues that included intellectual property, which ultimately landed me at the Recording Industry Association of America. I was able to join the music industry through this position that I love, which was legal and policy, and enter it at a time when technology was colliding with the interests of the music industry. So I got to work on a number of exciting issues, including the role of Napster and other unauthorized online services and its impact on music. I later joined Viacom, which is now Paramount Global, and got to work on film and television again at a time when technology threats abound. In that case, YouTube was taking off, but also using works that weren't authorized by content companies. And so I got to see the impact on distribution models and revenue models there, and then working jointly with other companies through the Motion Picture Association. And then ultimately joining ESA as its general counsel in 2015, looking to that as an opportunity to straddle together my passion for media and the arts with uh, a deeper dive into the tech space. So it's been full circle of working early in my career in an association space, working through an association on joint projects as a member of a company and member company of an association, and then coming back to association. Didn't have a goal of becoming a CEO one day, but I think all of those experiences really provided me with an appreciation of what the role requires, namely developing and executing on member-focused priorities. I love that journey. And I do think so many people in the association world either stay in it or come back to it. It's the member communities are so special and there's so much passion, whatever industry it is. 
that yeah. it just draws people in and, and keeps them there. I think you have to love the job of the association and what it can do. And you have to love chaos. If you love yeah. those two things, it'll work. If you don't like chaos, it, it, it can't work. <laughs> that would be the best descriptor I've, I've heard for association life. So that's great. Speaking of ESA, for our listeners who might not be as familiar with you all, can you explain the role and mission and, and how you really help serve as the voice and advocate for the U.S. video game industry? Sure. So video games are one of the most popular and dynamic forms of entertainment in the world. You have hundreds of millions of people playing in the U.S. and billions around the world. And that's a way for people to both have fun and stay connected. And that's one of the themes we've seen in video game play, particularly as connectivity has evolved and broadband has expanded. More and more people are looking to games not only for fun, but to stay connected. And obviously we saw that heavily during the pandemic when a lot of families were able to stay in touch through games. At ESA, we advocate for this vibrant, interactive world of video games and represent the innovators, the creators, and the businesses that really fuel that engine for the industry. Uh, this is our 30th year uh, of being in existence. We were founded in 1994. Uh, under a different name, the Interactive Digital Software Association. But our founding companies really believe that collectively we could represent industry well, and at the same time creating uh, a rate, an, an age rating uh, organization, the ESRB, the Entertainment Software Rating Board, which we can talk about later. But really thinking about that collective impact. For us today, as we look at policymakers looking to regulate how technology is progressing, it's really important that we remind them and in many cases educate them on the role that video games play, the kind of safeguards we put into place for our players and the economic potential of our industry. So for us, the core is really making sure people understand what video games are, how they've progressed and the great tools that we have in place to enhance play and protect consumers. I, I love how precise that is and, and how focused you all are. And I think what resonates with me and where I see associations have success is when you know your members, what they need, and you know your mission and everything comes back to that. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. And we spend a lot of time thinking about where our industry needs to be, sometimes advocating with our industry and where we think they need to be, but ultimately moving forward on those aligned areas for the industry. The, the video game industry obviously has a really huge cultural and economic impact, and, and you all do research to assess that. Can you share some of those key stats and insights? Sure. And these days, if, if you don't have data to help your advocacy, you're really missing an important component. Every year, ESA publishes a report called The Essential Facts about the U.S. video game industry. And in our 2024 report, we learned that more people than ever are playing games, both individually and with others. In the U.S. alone, more than 190 million people play. That's more than 60% of people playing every week. And the people who are playing games are always different than people think. But when you unpack it, it makes a lot of sense. The average age, for example, is about 36 years old. And that's up from 20, 25 years ago, where it may have been 29 or 30. But as people age and have been playing for a while, they can, that age, average age continues to increase. The gender split is about 50-50. We do this in the U.S. every year, and it's usually pretty close. We've seen worldwide estimates by other organizations, and it typically turns out close to 50-50. So again, more people and a more diverse group of people are playing than ever. And when you talk about racial and ethnic breakdowns, it mirrors the U.S. demographics. One thing people may not be aware of is that 29% of players are 50 years of age or older. And again, really? as people have been playing, if you think about if you're 50 today, you were born in 1974-ish, depending on when in the year you were born, video games were beyond their nascency. People were playing. They had home systems. You were playing Atari. You were playing in television. And if that's been part of your life as you continue, even if you've gone through a period of time where you haven't played, it's familiar to you. It's, it's probably what piano lessons were in the 50s and 60s, right? Everyone did it. And I think as people play, they see it. And particularly as people look at their families, they view video games as a fun individual and family activity. So more and more people are playing. The other thing we do is we publish a report every other year on the economic impact of video games. And it really shows the outsized influence that video games have on the American economy. We really have a multiplier effect. Right now, spending on video games has grown from 15 billion in 2013 to more than 57 billion in 2023. And that's meant that there's more going towards GDP 
and the like. So we have $101 billion economic impact in the US with $66 billion impact on GDP. And we also pay a lot of taxes. I and mean, people don't realize like so many games are made in the US. It's a global industry, but so many are based here. And so we pay more than $15 billion in state, federal, and local taxes. So more and more you're seeing the impact, but more importantly for us, we create jobs. We create high paying jobs. More than 105,000 people work in the video game industry in the United States with an average salary of almost $170,000, which is more than double the national average. So it's a constantly growing industry, which has family supporting jobs, but also very creative and technology forward thinking. Yeah, that's amazing. The big takeaway for me, I, we'll get into advocacy and how important having these kind of stats is for that, but the, the economic impact studies, that's something I feel like every association needs to do for their industry. I worked at a business travel association and we did something similar where you could say, this is what we're paying in taxes. This is the jobs we're creating. This is the impact to GDP. And that got so much media coverage for the association. And one of my favorite stories was we had a New York Times reporter who we'd do an exclusive with every quarter when the new report came out. And we always said, because the correlation was business travel drives business growth. And he got on a call and said that to us. He goes, we know business travel drives business growth. I can't even put it on mute. We're like, oh, huh. we're cheering. We're like, we did it. We got the message out. But having those stats, that lets you tell the story of your industry. And that's a huge impact the video game industry is having that. I think people think video games think fun and, and playing and, and not necessarily wow, what an amazing impact on this economy and on connecting people and families and, and lives together. Yeah, and, and you know as well as anyone having worked in this space, the more localized you can make that, the better. And one of the things we're always refining, but that we've included in our materials and certainly on our website is what is our impact on each state and to the extent we can in each district? Because we advocate both at the federal and state level and being able to say, hey, within your state, within your district, there are this many schools with video game development programs or this many studios or this many workers, it helps really humanize the the industry to people who think it, it's a coastal job market when in fact there are studios all over the country. Yeah, no, nothing beats that local data. And I'd love to dive more into advocacy and hear more about your top policy priorities and how you're working to support the growth and protection of the industry this year. Yeah. First and foremost, we always like to remind people that video games are designed to be fun and to entertain us because that's been the primary driver. But it's always been more than that. And and as we unpack it for policymakers in particular, they really appreciate that. First of all, video game technology really always expands beyond where we are uh, because the video game player community wants something that dazzles them, not only in terms of the storyline, but also in terms of the execution of the game. And so a lot of the technologies, whether it's VR and AR technologies, end up having a lot of impetus from the game industry. We may not invent all of it, but we have a consumer base that wants to see things differently. And so we end up having an outsized impact on technology development and in other areas, be it education, sports, and even healthcare, more and more you're finding physical therapists using video games as a way to have people using their limbs to do repetitive exercises. And so we're seeing that its use in other fields ends up having a very big impact and a very positive impact. The other thing is for us in terms of technological advancements, we understand how these technologies get used and we try to introduce that to policymakers so they understand how to make common sense legislation and regulations. So for example, we've been using AI for decades in our industry. Uh, both to help create certain aspects of the game, but also to improve the gameplay experience. Sometimes you have non-playable characters within a game that are helping you along or helping the storyline move along. And you may not realize that it's an AI or AI-related function that you're interacting with in the game, but they help make it fun. Now that AI, particularly generative AI, has gotten a lot of attention from policymakers, we need to remind them that there are multiple uses of AI and that if you try to legislate in one particular way, you may impact it. other industries, including ours, in unintended ways. And so it's important for them to really regulate what's of most concern and not just AI, because we've seen some legislation, in fact, in some states trying to regulate algorithms. And oh. you have to say to them, I, I, if you like your Google Maps, you like algorithms, right? Yeah. So that's not what you mean. But the easier you make those examples to digest, the, the more meaningful the, the conversation. 
I think beyond that, as creators and artists of the folks who make video games, we're very big defenders of free expression, but also intellectual property and intellectual property protection. That's critically important for our industry. It's been a, the lifeblood for our industry of being able to create those things. And then we have a long history of self-regulation. We're one of the first and certainly one of the most successful industries that has self-regulation. The Federal Trade Commission looks at our age rating systems and our tools for parents as second to none and over again have looked at us as an example of an industry that's doing it in the right way. One thing I want to call back to and what you said there for our listeners to make sure they heard was that aspect of education, whether it's Capitol Hill or in your state or local officials, that's a huge role for associations because the individual companies, it's harder for them to send that message and to not feel like they're very self-serving. Whereas you guys are there speaking on behalf of this whole industry and with well-backed research and it just plays differently than someone else individually trying to sell that story as someone who has an invested stake in a company. Yeah. And, and we have found that if we make frequent touches, you don't have to do it all at once. You can really provide them with the information they need at the time and help them digest what we do as an industry and then allow those proof points to become self-evident. And that way, as you begin to advocate for something more specifically, you've not only built the currency to say what you're doing, but You've also built trust that you're trying to advocate in an authentic and positive way. And we try to do that at, at every level, state and federal. And, and we found a lot of success in doing that, but it's constant. There's always something someone has a question about. And if you spend any time with a policymaker or regulator, they are seeing so many things and so many different topics at one time that sometimes you need to slow it down to say, here's how, for example, video games are slightly different than social media. And so as you're looking to regulate social media, don't think of it as tech. Think of it as one aspect of tech and we're a different aspect because of the things that we do. So uh, another area I want to talk about is digital wellness. For me, a personal pet peeve is when people have that stereotype of video gamers as lazy. And I imagine that probably would annoy you all <laughs> even more. But that, that is something I've seen as a really important part of ESA's mission and would love to know more about how you're promoting this and really ensuring a balanced lifestyle for players of all ages. Yeah, one of the first things we, we recognize is that video games are, again, among the most dynamic and most enjoyed entertainment products in the world. And for us, that means trying to prioritize a positive experience for the entire player community and to provide easy to use tools for players and especially parents and caregivers to manage numerous aspects of gameplay. Balanced lifestyle can mean different things to different families. You've got billions of people around the world playing most as a casual hobby. There are some who are creating careers out of video games, whether they're playing esports or they're streaming or they're creating games or the like. And so we want to make sure that we're thinking about the various uses and figuring out what balance means for every family and every situation. But for us, that means first educating people on the fact that video games are not simply a passive activity that some other intended product might do. They're actually engaging. And so understanding that they have a positive impact on how students want to learn is critically important. Understanding that video games actually have a beneficial impact on mental health is important for people to understand. And there are plenty of surveys and reports done by third parties that we rely on to share that information. So for example, there's a 2021 study that found that three and four participants found video games uh, beneficial to the mental health. There was a 2014 study that found that 10 to 15 year olds had lower levels of stress who play video games. So we try to bring in different levers of information that aren't simply our data, but data from universities. There's also data showing that girls who play video games end up not only being inspired by the games, but um, having our propensity to have STEM degrees from college than girls who didn't play. So in looking at the actual facts of the impact of video games, that's critically important. And then for parents concerned about screen time and what their kids are doing, we have family guides that give you information on how to talk about games, but also how to train you on using the device tools that allow you to manage family usage. And for all the consoles and a lot of other devices, for example, you can manage the amount of time and money spent, and you can limit whether there's interactivity with others, whether you're on the internet or playing on the system. 
So for us, it's really providing information to families to understand what tools are at their disposal and how to manage that use within their homes. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to have to check out those guides. We have a, a three and a half year old who she's not started gaming yet, but w- when she does, I'll check those out and, and see how we can manage it properly. <laughs> All right. So transparency and consumer protection, a really critical piece for the video game industry. How are you all advocating for policies that help support that positive, safe, inclusive environment for gamers? I mentioned earlier, we've been around 30 years. And when the founders of ESA or its predecessor created ESA, they also created an organization called the Entertainment Software Rating Board. And that was initially created to provide age and content ratings with respect to video games so that players, but especially parents, could make determinations on exactly what is coming into their homes and how they want it to enter. That has expanded in many ways, both to provide more information about what's in the game and the ability to connect with others, but also the ability of consoles to do more. And then our companies themselves creating a variety of tools so that when you're on their networks and not simply on the console, you can be sure that there are player safety tools in place, whether that means advanced moderation tools, extensive codes of contact, reporting mechanisms, but all to create a positive and safe environment. At the end of the day, if you're a video game company trying to attract players to want to be there, you want to create as positive an experience as possible. So playing within the video game ecosystem is different than being on a social media platform where you're trying to provide information about your views on the latest development in the world. This is really about gameplay. And so how do you keep that experience as positive as possible? And when you're online, you've got to make sure that you enhance the tools that are available to manage that aspect. And that's something that our companies do day in, day out. That's awesome. Another thing I feel like every industry tries to claim are the buzzwords of the, we're the most innovative, we're creative. But with those words, everyone associates that with video gaming and that just fits perfectly. How are you all trying to support the development of creative content and, and those innovative products? And, and how are you helping protect those innovations too? Yeah, one of the early markers of our industry was that there were so many different kinds of games. And in fact, there were some that created court challenges. <laughs> and out of that experience, our industry really grew a strong spine on protecting free expression because we felt it was so vital in providing consumers with a wide variety of gameplay experiences, but also making sure that we provided information about what's in the game so that families could make choices about what's important to them. And so we, we've had a very staunch support of free expression but also and the First Amendment, but also on uh, creating strong protections for intellectual property, because we've got to make sure that that expression gets to be expressed in the way that people want, and it's protected so that we can uh, continue to make those games and support the amazing ecosystem that games have developed. So for us, really, when you think about innovation and creativity, it's about allowing people to make games from their perspective, protecting that ability and protecting that content and creating innovative ways for people to connect with it. One of the things we're really excited to see among the the creative community is more voices coming into the fold and creating games that share different perspectives. And that's been exciting to see because storyline has become just as important to many people as getting to the next level in a game, like feeling like you can embody a character. And that in turn is created empathy, right? If you're playing as a character that doesn't have your traits, you take on some of their traits to understand their perspective. And that ability to provide a different voice is actually creating a high level of empathy among players. So we just see a lot of positive aspects from creating that space for new voices to make games. Another big area where we're seeing associations push boundaries and and reach new levels is through collaboration and, and partnerships. What are you guys doing on that front and and are you seeing success there? For us, collaboration has been key. And I will say in our early years as as an association, it was harder to find some of the collaborations over the tougher areas. Obviously, if there are common areas like intellectual property protection or free expression, there were a lot of collaborators and partners. But when there were very video game specific regulations, sometimes it was hard to get friends and allies. Over time, what we've realized is you've got to help build those relationships. You've got to support others, but also show them why supporting you is beneficial to their outcomes. And that had a very lasting impact on where we are today. 
just a few examples of some of our collaborations here in the US. There are organizations that are in the tech space and in the creative space that we partnered with, be it on content protection with the Motion Picture Association or the Recording Industry Association, Recording Industry Association. Within the tech sector, actually at the RNC and DNC, the, the conventions, we co-sponsored an event called the Innovation Nation with about eight or nine other organizations. And we were able to host panels and events throughout the day where policymakers could both participate and engage in areas in tech that they should care about. And it was a way for us to also be aligned with organizations who are doing really amazing things in the tech space. Uh, and so we've done it on the tech space and on the creative space. There are also other partner organizations around the world. We focus on the representation of the U.S. video game industry. And there are partner associations around the world that are regional country, region or country based. And so we've collaborated with them on a number of projects, including a report we put out last year, the first ever called The Power of Play. It was a global report that shows that video games are not only fun, but have a positive impact on people's uh, emotional and social lives, makes them less anxious, less isolated, less stressed. And that ended up being a, a report of 13,000 gamers from 12 different countries. And we also included peer reviewed studies alongside those results just to show the impact of games. And then there are things that when I say them, you won't believe me, but they're true. Like the AARP has been one of our longstanding partners because they've witnessed the power of games for the older playing community. They do studies on it. It's their most popular page on their website. And so we've worked with the AARP, the American Heart Association, and other groups that share this interest in making sure that all communities are connected and working together. And so we've had some really interesting collaborations over the years. That's so cool. And I do live the ARP. So I am on the Washington Women in PR Board of Directors. And one of our big sponsors is AARP. And Martha Boudreau is their chief communications and marketing officer. And she leads different professional developments throughout the year and, and different things like that, that I've either sat in on virtually or in person. She is amazingly brilliant. And I, I can imagine working with her on something. How, yeah. how did that all They are a first class organization. They are so good at what they do. That's fantastic. I want to tie a bow on things. ESA has, has really achieved just incredible success when it comes to advocating for the video game industry. So what do you want to leave our listeners with? How, what has been helpful to your approach and what can other associations learn from that, from what went well? Yeah, for us, it's getting back to basics, no matter how hairy things get or how busy they get. First and foremost, we constantly make sure that our priority issues and our positions are aligned with our members. Consensus can be hard to reach, particularly when companies have competing or conflicting interests. But in the end, being aligned from the get-go is critical to success. I think second is that advocacy is a constellation of activities that drive to the desired outcome. It used to be that shoe leather walk in the halls of Congress was the way that you connected. But direct political outreach isn't enough. You've got to have the media outreach. You've got to do your legal and regulatory filings. You've got to have your industry and third-party reports. And you've got to position your association as a trusted partner in various offices because when they're coming to you with questions they may have, even to just get information, that's a good sign because it means that you're someone who they can rely on to provide candid and straightforward information. And then third, harnessing the cloud of third-party allies and partners. That can really be critical in creating an echo chamber around policy priorities. So I think for us, those are the basics that we come back to make sure we're grounded in the right way. That's so great. I know everyone will find this super valuable. Before we let you go, though, we have a, a just for fun portion that we like to, to wrap up all of our podcasts with so our audience can get, get to know you a little more. So first question is easy. Tell us where you grew up. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. So sometimes I play urban and sometimes I play suburban. Love it. <laughs> All right. What's your Starbucks order or your morning drink routine if you're not a Starbucks fan? Uh, so Starbucks, I do like it, particularly when you're on the road and you're not sure of uh, what the local scene is. But I do try to find local places wherever I am. And it's usually a, a basic drink, like a flat white or something, not overly milked. And I've been on an oat milk kick for the past six or eight months. But usually it's like a simple espresso with a touch of some kind of froth oat milk. But I do love Starbucks, but I also love trying to find the local spot. Nice. So if you won the lottery tomorrow, would you still work? 
Yes, it's fun. I, I think of my various roles as projects that need to get something done and I need to get certain things done. So uh, until I accomplish whatever that is, uh, I feel like my, my role is never done. And, and frankly, my role has been in three phases as CEO. The first was getting the job a few months before COVID, leading through COVID, and now leading out of COVID. And so there has always been change involved. And each time we've gotten better at what we do, but there's still more to do. I would definitely up my philanthropic game, something in arts and education. And so I could see myself at some point veering into that territory if I won the lottery. But I just love what we do here. And I love the people I work with. And I do think association work is just fantastic. That's awesome. I, as someone who launched a company during COVID, I feel that pain too. <laughs> what was the last show that you binge watched? Ooh, I typically watch shows on travel, like on planes as a break from work because it's harder to binge watch at home. I've got a high school senior who's going to college this fall, so maybe there'll be more time for that. I loved watching The Bear on Hulu. On Netflix, I've been watching a lot of sports series documentaries. So they had one called like Sprint about these like oh. Olympic sprinters, which you got to watch before the Olympics. They had Tour de France, so, so cyclist, quarterback. So I just love these quick summaries of who's hot in every sport. I think they have one on Simone Biles that they put out right before the Olympics. So I love those. Nice. And then Ted Lasso and oh, all those fun shows. Can't go yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. Awesome. What's a food you can't live without? Smoothies. I love smoothies. Nice. And your bucket list travel destination. Everyone wants to do a safari, so sign me up for that. Uh, but there are some other places. Like I find that we as Americans, we tend to stay north and fly east. We tend to go to Europe a lot. So lately we've been looking more South America and different regions. So I think a safari would be fun, but you have to save up a lot for that. <laughs> Very cool. I'm going to throw one more in. Do you, are you allowed to have a favorite video game or is that like a parent saying of a favorite child in your line of work? <laughs> uh, I, the honest answer is I play what my kid plays because it keeps me in tune with what he thinks is relevant. And so I usually track that all. I, I try to play as many different games as possible just to know what's happening. I'm better at the older games and indoor games. I'm better at sports games. I'm better at games you can get in and out of. But I like to see what's happening, generally speaking. But I usually track what, what, what my son is doing. Love that. That's awesome. Stan, thank you again. I just so appreciate you joining us on the A100 today. No, and thank you for the work you're doing. I'm, I'm glad that what you started as a seedling is really growing and is really having great impact in the association world. That's a wrap for today's episode. The Association 100 Podcast is a production of Onward and Upward Marketing and Communications, where our mission is to make associations and nonprofits the go-to source in their industries through earned media and thought leadership. This podcast is an extension of the A100 newsletter, a bi-monthly collection of best practices, top trends, helpful ideas, and smart strategies delivered straight to your inbox. Have you undertaken a big change at your association, or do you have some words of wisdom for the trenches of association life? We want to hear from you, and so do our listeners. Drop us a note at info at onwardupward.com. That's info at onwardupward.com. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe, give us a five-star review, and share with your friends and colleagues. We're available anywhere podcasts are found. Come back next week for more association inspiration and insights. Thanks for tuning in.